Our next speaker is James Smith. By day, James works as a chartered accountant and data professional at Flutter Entertainment PLC, leading on innovation and tech within group finance. By night and on the weekends, Sports Cord is his side hustle, creative outlet and vehicle for learning new tools and technologies. James lives in London with his wife, Alice, and dog, Pippin, and enjoys going to Chelsea games, but not this season, and following Formula One and visiting new places. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about side hustles, sports data, uh, and data biz. So uh, yeah, by day, uh, I'm, I'm an accountant. I found my way into uh, the bridge between data and finance uh, at Flutter Entertainment. So Flutter, a little bit like Alphabet and Google, Flutter is not particularly well known as a brand in itself, but it is kind of a house for Lots of different brands uh, that you may have heard of, Paddy Power, Betfair, FanDuel over in the US, so lots of sports betting uh, brands around the world. And that, that's kind of great for me. It's a, it's a nice spot between accounting, data, and sport, and that's it's kind of my, my sweet spot. That's what I, what I love to do. Um, by night, uh, weekends, I have my own business, Sports Court, <clears throat> and reflecting a little bit on what Nadia was saying earlier about creativity. Uh, it's, it's my vehicle to be creative outside of my day job. It's, uh, there is such a thing as creative accounting. Uh, it's not something that uh, is always a good thing. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a way that I can... I spend a lot of time in, in SQL, Python. Uh, we use old tricks at, at Flutter. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of automation style work. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so being able to, to do something a bit more visual outside of work. Uh, and it's not, not always been the case. I have done... Uh, before I worked at Flutter, I worked uh, for a year and a bit at uh, Biztree, which was a, a Tableau consultancy. So I spent a bit of time doing different things. Uh, but uh, yeah, Sports Cord is, is my vehicle for learning, creativity, and, and sports data biz. In, in March this year, uh, I had the, the biggest co collaboration that Sports Cord had had to date, uh, working with Formula One. So they've recently, uh, there's a, a company called Round Room that uh, teamed up with Formula One um, and they created this exhibition and the idea for the exhibition is that it'll, it'll span over uh, a series of years, uh, it'll move around different places, so it started in Madrid in March but it's going to go out to various different places in Europe uh, maybe for three or four months, it's going to go over to the US, it's going to go over to Asia, uh, so it's going to go all around the world um, and they put together a nice promotional video that uh, explains it better than, than I can. So. Nice flashy video, got everyone nice and uh, excited and energized. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, launched this exhibition. Uh, as part of that, I had a couple of um, pieces within that. There was two digital applications uh, where I had to design basically a, a user interface, a dashboard where people could come and toggle different filters, uh, things like that, and metrics. It was a weighted model uh, that looked at various different things, race wins, pole positions, um, and so on. Uh, and they yeah, created all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then displayed it on a screen, and basically you, you vote at the end of this. And so the exhibition has a database behind who the exhibition thinks is the greatest, because it's a, it's the, it's a, it's the discussion throughout all sports, whether it's tennis with uh, Federer and Nadal, whether it's Messi or Ronaldo. I know where we are here, it's probably Ronaldo. Uh, but yeah, in Formula One, there's a series of drivers, and everyone has their own reasons for, for who is the greatest of all time. So uh, for this, uh, you're able to vote for your own, and then the exhibition can curate and uh, understand patterns on, on who you're saying. So in Madrid, I imagine there's lots of votes for Fernando Alonso. There's kind of allegiances, depending on where you're going. But in other places where the exhibition might go, uh, that, that will change. Um, it was actually really interesting being at the exhibition, just seeing users start to interact with it. Um, we hadn't, we'd done a little bit of testing before, sent it out to various friends, colleagues, and 
Uh, the people that I was working with had, had tested it as well, but when the, the masses started to arrive and started, uh, so I was kind of behind them looking over their shoulders, how are you using this application that we've built? And uh, uh, yeah, there was some interesting stuff that uh, we hadn't thought about before, which we're looking to develop for, for future exhibitions. Uh, the other part of it was a eight meter wide graphic, a stream graph, um, which you can see here in front of these two beautiful machines. Um, and uh, yeah, it took, took a while. That was created in, in D3, tied it up in Illustrator. Uh, and it's, yeah, you walk into the room and it, it's kind of a, it's quite humbling to see it all up in, in the wall and it's um, in all its beauty. So, uh, the proud moment, the, uh, there's been a couple of people that have, have visited from the, the world of Formula One. So the, the person in the middle there is Stefano Domenicali, who had a, a guided tour. He's kind of the sponsor of the exhibition. And nice moment seeing him just sitting there in front of uh, a stream graph bit of data viz. Um, but yeah, th this, didn't, this didn't happen overnight. There's, uh, there's a kind of a, a long story leading up to this, this point in time. Uh, and it goes back to, to March 2017 and Disneyland Paris. So was there with uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, now wife, and we, it was, it was on, on reflection, it's kind of a, a strange place for two 23-year-olds with no kids to go uh, to Disneyland Paris, but uh, I think she was in a bit of a nostalgia. Uh, she'd been there a few times as a kid, I said hi. Uh, so we, yeah, decided we'll go to Disneyland Paris. And um, there's a lot of cues, a lot of time to think. Uh, it kind of coincided with, I'd been asked to, to learn Tableau at work, um, and I'd read a, an interesting article and seen a chord diagram for the first time uh, showing migration and, and how different yeah, migration flows across the world. I thought, wow, that's a, it's a very interesting looking diagram. Um, so I returned from Disneyland and I decided, oh, okay, I'll have a go at uh, creating this myself. So using the, uh, using the circleize package in, in R, uh, put some data, I scraped it in from transfermark.com um, I always start with using sports data. It's kind of the, the stuff that I know and that I'm comfortable with. So put it into R. Uh, there were some pretty awful iterations, but finally uh, had something that I was relatively happy with. Put it into Illustrator um, to tidy a few things up and then put it into Photoshop to create the, the mock-ups. Um, and all of this, this was kind of, it was just a hobby. It was something that I was interested, a side project. This wasn't, at this point, a side hustle. When it became a side hustle is when, uh, according to our friends at dictionary.com, uh, it turned from being a project into something that earned a, a passive income. So at the point that I put it onto Etsy and opened it up for people to purchase as a print, that's the point at which it became a side hustle. Um, and this, this definition about it being about having that uh, secondary source of income, it, I suppose it, it makes sense, that's kind of what the side hustle is, but to me, it's always been a lot more than that. Um, the, the passive income is, is a nice benefit, but it's more that vehicle for creativity, for learning, uh, and so on. And I suppose in the, in the data viz context, as we are today, um, yeah, it, it's much more about the ability to go out, learn a new language for a reason, um, when you're not constrained with, with what you're being told to do nine till five in your day job. So I'm gonna go through uh, a few things that I've learned along the road. This was a picture of a lovely chocolate cake yesterday, but uh, having had some pastel donata, I thought I'd change it to something a bit more venue specific. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna work through some of the, the ingredients uh, that I've found, and hopefully for those that are interested in, in starting up and having your own side hustle, uh, these will be useful um, to you as, you as you embark on this journey. Or if you've already got a side hustle, hopefully there's a, a few things that you can learn. So within the, in the data viz world, the designs are the, the kind of core. This is the most important stuff that you've got. Um, it's a chance to be creative. This is gonna go onto a wall at some point uh, if someone buys it, so be creative. Again, going back to the, the bar charts. Bar charts are great for insights, but uh, not everyone wants a bar chart on their wall. So be creative, um, express different things that you're, you're looking at, use visual metaphors uh, and so on. The chord diagram was obviously the, the thing that kicked all of this off, and I iterated on the chord diagram, mainly uh, colors, um, titles, that kind of stuff, over the first few years. Um, don't do so much on the, on the chord diagram anymore. Um, actually, interesting, went to, it, it, during lockdown, um, spent a lot of time doing a bit of, of woodwork on the side, and went to a, a craft fair. Uh, and so I had the woodwork being sold on one side, and then the prints being sold on the other. And, 
being a data viz audience, I'm sure you're all aware kind of how to interpret a core diagram, but general public look at a core diagram and don't really know how to understand it. And when you're selling online, it's, it's difficult to portray what the core diagram means. You need to capture their attention and retain it for a certain amount of time. Whereas being in person at a craft fair, people were interested, they came and had a look, and you had the chance to understand what the core diagram actually means and, and explain that to them. So uh, it was a yeah, different, different kind of marketplace and uh, area that you're actually going and selling these. So craft fairs outside of the online world of Etsy, Shopify, and so on, uh, really nice, interesting place, not only to, to sell stuff, but also to meet people and have a discussion about things. Outside of the core diagram, and it's not all sports related, I also have interest in, in Lord of the Rings, as I'm sure many people in this room do. It's kind of a, goes hand in hand, data viz and uh, Lord of the Rings nerdery. So, um, <laughs> yeah, pulled together to this one, um, and then uh, this is kind of the, the main print, the best seller on the shop. Uh, took loads of different data sources and wanted to create a Formula One on a page, on a print. Um, so. This one, I actually put this together um, quite a few years ago now and iterate on it each year, so every time. Obviously, Formula One's a, a living sport. You've got data coming in all the time, so this was a 2021 edition. Since then, had to update uh, with, with Max Verstappen on it a couple of times, uh, probably a third time this year. Um, so yeah, as this is kind of the thing that opened up a lot of doors. Not only is it a print on the shop, but people were, were interested in the creation process, the, the design, um, and so, this is actually ultimately what led to the, the first conversations with the, the team at the F1 exhibition for, for that. So you're designing things because you, you like doing it, you love it, you're interested in a particular topic. Obviously, it doesn't have to be sport. It could be music, it could be food, anything, travel. Um, you're designing something because you want to. You put it up there, people buy it as a nice side product, um, and then things may, may come out of that as well. Uh, and that, that's... Yeah, that's the, the design side, products and suppliers. Uh, the reason that I've grouped these two together, um, for those that haven't heard about drop shipping, it's a wonderful way of not having to maintain an inventory yourself. So I went through several different suppliers until I found Prodigy. Uh, Prodigy are a company, a drop shipping company that have a global network. So when an order comes in from a customer, wherever they are in the world, if it's the US, uh, UK, they've got distribution centers in Netherlands, Australia, US and UK, and so the They've got the same products in all of them. They will uh, produce a print, a framed print. I've not really got into um, phone cases, mugs, all other kind of, the, the usual merchandise you would, you would think of. They've got it all, um, but yeah, I focus mainly on the, the prints and frame prints. Um, so they'll, they'll take the, uh, the design, they'll produce it, they'll ship it to the customer. Uh, and the other nice thing about Prodigy, uh, and, and a lot of the, They've got competitors, obviously. A lot of them will do the same thing, but Prodigy have an API that, um, again, a lockdown project. I was able to connect up the Prodigy API to the Etsy API. So when a new order comes in on Etsy, um, details are sent to Prodigy. They start producing it. They fulfill it. And then once it's marked as dispatched on, on Prodigy, that will then update Etsy to say, order's on your way to the customer. So it's all, it's all automated. And that's kind of it's a nice part where that's more of the kind of stuff that I would be doing in my day job, but it was something that I learned and executed on the side job. So there's, yeah, there's nice things that you can learn from main job to side job that, you, that fulfill both worlds. Next up is the marketplace. So Etsy, you need somewhere to sell. Etsy is fantastic for creatives. There's a huge amount of stuff on there. Uh, I know there's, there's other people in the data viz world that have moved on to Etsy with uh, creating your store makes it very easy to reach an audience without having to do a huge amount of marketing. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, other, other marketplaces, you could uh, go down the Shopify route, have a completely bespoke stuff uh, set up on, your, on a website, um, but then you have to handle driving traffic to that website, whereas Etsy's got that marketplace. Um, I think Redbubble, there's, there's a few other ones. So Etsy's the one that I would go with. Um, it's getting more and more crowded. I think side hustles have become a little bit more uh, popular, especially with the changing patterns of work and lots of spare time during, uh, during the lockdowns, during COVID. So more people are on there, it's more abundant, so you have to make your, your designs and your presence a little bit more unique to, to stand out. Um, as part of the, the stuff that I was doing, the, the, I'll get onto timelines in a second actually, but the, um, the work that I was doing on the prints, it's kind of shifted a little bit more. So 
Whereas it started as a, as a Prince business, more recently I've, I've moved into working with sports organizations and teams and doing a bit more consulting on either data strategy or uh, going back to doing a bit of Tableau dashboard building for a couple of these companies. So Intelligent Cricket uh, doing cricket analytics. Left Field are a football analytics consultancy uh, led by Richard Battle. I spent a bit of time analyzing football data. I don't, don't know huge about cricket, but found it really interesting to do that. Um, and all these pieces of work kind of came off the back of people reaching out after they'd seen something that I'd created, whether that was a, a print or a visualization that I'd shared on Twitter or LinkedIn. So creating that, uh, that network and it's, uh, you'll, you'll create something and it maybe, maybe doesn't get a, a huge reaction when you release it, but uh, like, like with the cricket stuff, I created something and two years down the line, someone found it and, and reached out and said, oh, we're, we're interested in, in working with you. Could you, uh, could you recreate that with some of the data that we've got? So um, things don't always happen in sequence. There's a little bit of patience and we'll get onto to timelines in a second as well. Next up is maybe the, the less sexy, the less exciting side of, of this uh, accounting. I find it interesting. I know a lot of people don't. Uh, but you do need to do, need to do it. If you're, if you're a business, you need to do things like issue invoices. Um, you need to be able to collect money, so you need a bank account. Um, two things that I found really useful along this journey, and I didn't find them straight away. Zero, uh, I think there's Zero, Sage, there's a few of them out there. QuickBooks uh, allow you to, to manage your accountants. Maybe you want to hire an accountant once, you're, once you kind of get your business up and running, but this makes it very easy to do it. a lot of this business administration yourself. Um, and Tide, I think uh, there's a lot of these challenger banks, Tide, Monzo, Starling, depending, depending on where you're from, there are banks that offer very cheap or free uh, business bank accounts that you can set up um, and, and so on. So there's a couple of things there that, uh, that, are, that are important. Marketing is something that I am abysmal at. I've not really ever got into marketing. Um, a bit like with the, the Google Chrome Safari, is something, the part of the, the business that I'm not interested in at the moment. Uh, it's, it's important, and I'm not gonna tell you not to do it. Marketing, uh, obviously if, you, if you're going down the Shopify route, if you're hosting your prints on a website, you need to drive traffic to that website, so you've got your, your SEO and you've got um, Google Ads, Facebook Ads. You need a way of promoting your product so that people come in, land on it, think, oh, that's a nice design, I will buy it as a gift or for myself. So. Marketing is really important. Um, I've got to the stage now where uh, I've got a friend of a friend who is very good at this stuff, and uh, I'm looking at, at paying them to maybe to do some of the marketing, create campaigns and so on, and run with them themselves. So marketing is important, but I'm not, not your guy for it. You can, you're going to have to find someone else to talk about that. <laughs> Timelines. So what should you expect? If you, if you go away from today, uh, what should you expect? Should you expect sales to flood in? Nope. Uh, first sale, obviously a family member. Next nine or ten sales, mix of family members and friends, maybe a repeat buyer, that's nice. Uh, but then there's that wonderful moment when someone that you don't know lands on your, your product and purchases it and you, you make a sale. So that's a, it's a pretty nice feeling. Uh, it's kind of a, an, an acknowledgement that you've done something right and someone else out there wants to buy uh, something that you've created. Um, then you get reviews coming in, so you get to start to get a, a, a sense of what people are, are thinking about, uh, the products giving you some advice. Um, some of it, m most of it's good, some of it is critical. Um, if you ever want a lot of nasty but constructive criticism, then put something on, on Reddit. Uh, they'll tear whatever you've got to pieces, and there might be a little nugget of information that you could actually use, but most of it will just be, oh, you missed out the data point from 10 years ago. Um, the jumps, so yeah took over a thousand days to make the first 500 sales uh, and then it started to get a little bit more rapid after that, gain a little bit more traction. Um, seasonality is very important, so Christmas, obviously the big time that people will be buying gifts, uh, so if you come away from today, want to set up your shop, then um, you should expect, obviously, a, a rise in, in sales around that, that time around Christmas. Um, the other thing, though, it's not it doesn't continue getting faster. The thing about a side hustle, it's not something that I can commit a huge amount of time to, and we'll get to the, uh, to the day job versus night job conundrum in a little bit, but um, 
As I've started to do more consulting, I've noticed that the Etsy sales have actually dropped, and that's because I've stopped making new prints to put on the shop. It's not because I don't want to, I just have other things going on with the, uh, with the consulting side, and that's where I'm interested at the moment. Um, so, yeah, don't expect, if you don't nurture a bit like a garden, if you don't tend and nurture your, your plants and put new plants in, uh, then it's not going to grow magically. Um, so, yeah, there's a certain amount of, of ticking along, and obviously the, the automation of um, Etsy and Prodigy makes it very easy to, to have a passive income that kind of keeps on things ticking over. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't grow magically. You have to put a lot of, of hard work into this. Um, other things mentioned on supplier, I mean, if, if I were you I would, and you were interested in doing this, I'd go with Prodigy straight away. There was a time right at the start where I was using a supplier called Toad Prints, based in uh, Chippenham in the UK, and they were really cheap, and that was what I needed at the time, uh, but they were extremely unreliable. Um, for international orders, I'd have to get them sent to my house and then go down to the post office with like a bundle of things on a Friday night, and it's not sustainable. So Prodigy with that global distribution network are, are brilliant for that kind of stuff. They're a little bit more expensive, um, but that's, that's you kind of pay for what you get. It's, it's much more reliable. They've got great customer service as well. So the balance between day job and night job, um, there's a few practicalities, a few things that you need to think about uh, contractually. Like if you've got a contract with a company, you're, they're your main priority. You're getting paid to do a job. Um, and so it's worth having a chat with your manager, with, uh, with whoever's kind of um, looking at that contract just to make sure that there is a, a clause in there saying, I have got a, a side business. Um, it's not going to uh, interact with any of the stuff that I do from my nine to five. Um, same with tools, so use Tableau at work, but I will never use Tableau on the license that Flutter pays for to work on, on any of my own stuff. I've got my own license for that. So there's, there's practicalities. Um, in terms of, of time management, there are definitely times that uh, I don't want to finish a nine till six day and go and, and make a print or do consulting. So uh, the nice thing is you get in as much as you, get out as much as you put in. It's, it's kind of, when you've got the time, you're the, your own boss, so you can do as much or a little as you want, and that's, that's the beauty of it. I find that uh, I'm most active and, and creative on, on sports called related stuff, actually about three or four days into a holiday. So whenever I go away, I've kind of parked all of my Flutter stuff and then have a few days and then I decide, oh, I'll turn to doing something that I'd written down quite a long time ago and I want to, to get into that. So got married in, in September and actually started making some new prints on the honeymoon, which a lot of people were a bit confused about. But it was, uh, it was my way of relaxing. It's something that I, I enjoy doing and it's, it's that, that creative itch that, uh, that you're able to scratch. Finally, it's, a, it's kind of a, a question. Does, does the side hustle ever become a main hustle? And obviously, it depends on the, the individual. I think uh, there are individuals probably in this room where side hustle has become a main hustle, and uh, you're, you're doing what you love so much that you decide, OK, I'm going to make this the, the main thing that I do, take the leap. And uh, I've got a huge amount of respect for the people that, uh, that go in to, to that take that jump, that have the clients that, uh, that take all of that risk onto themselves. Um, for me, I enjoy my day job. I enjoy the aspects of it that it brings that I can't get out of being a, a sole trader, a limited company on my own. Uh, so the interactions with people at work, I've got a, a great team at work that I like going into the office a couple of times a week to, to spend time with. Um, I like the big company feel. I'm able to work with people from around the world. Um, and that's not to say in the long run that you can do that with your own company. You, can't, you could build your own team. Uh, but for the, for the point I am in my career and my, my life, I, I kind of like the balance of being able to do interesting stuff with big budgets at work and creative stuff uh, with no budget at all on the side. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Hopefully, interesting. Hopefully, there's a few budding side hustlers. And, uh, <laughs>this is uh, Rudy from Ireland. Uh, fantastic presentation, really, really liked it. Um, I particularly liked how you kind of showed the different steps of the journey. If you go back to that slide that had your bullet points on it, describing the different things, the product and things like that, which was the one, oh, which was the one that after all that time, you were like, oh, I wish I had done that sooner. I wish I had sorted that first because it ended up costing you so much time in the long run. Yeah, okay, definitely the, um, the supplier. Uh, hands down, I think that's, uh, that's the part that um, the fulfillment, the uh, 
the knowledge that someone that runs a big company that does this for lots of different people um, can fulfill your orders and your products. Like the, the designs is something that you, you enjoy spending time doing. Uh, go into a post office and the, the postal system in the UK is pretty abysmal. Like uh, <laughs> going, going down on a Friday night to the post office with a bunch of prints is, uh, yeah, is not what you want to be doing. So the supplier side, um, ha have a look around. I'm not saying that Prodigy are the best. They're the ones that work for me. Uh, there are lots of drop shipping companies out there now, um, but for me, Prodigy are the ones that um, have, have kind of moved it from being uh, a little side hustle in the bedroom to something a bit more uh, seamless. I'm so struck too by the point that you made around when you first release something, it might be the thing that simmers and sits there on your website yeah. and you see page views, and then a year later someone says, I want to hire you because of this work, or I yeah. want you to do this thing. And I think that should give hope to any of us who might put things out there in the public space and don't immediately get like, you know, 20,000 retweets or whatever the metric is we look at these days. Um, other questions right here in the front, uh, right in the center. Hi. Um, are there some prints that uh, you were surprised by the success or some of us where it was the other way around? Like, you know, for instance, you spent a lot of time working on a piece. Do you... like? Basically, my question is probably, have you noticed a pattern or something? Yeah, I think part, part of it probably comes down to marketing as well and Etsy's algorithm. Like, uh, if something does well early on, I think when, when you upload a new listing to Etsy, there's a temporary boost where it'll come to the top of the, the page. Um, so I don't, yeah, for me, without the marketing, I don't think there's a strict relationship between what I think is good and what people by. Uh, the, the visual history of Formula One print um, has a lot of information and the Sankey makes it quite eye-catching so it stands out and um, people like the, the mix of something that looks interesting and is interesting uh, from a data perspective. Um, the, the, start, the chord diagrams and the, the start, I think the point that I made about um, having to explain them to a member of the public, I've not really cracked a way of explaining a chord diagram to someone who hasn't seen it before. Mm. It looks interesting. Uh, and there is insights to be had in there, but uh, it kind of comes down to a little bit what Nadi was talking about, art versus uh, data vision and insight. Um, yeah, so yeah, hopefully that answers that. And being mindful of our online folks, do we have one question from online yeah. before we wrap up? Yeah, we have one question from Astrid Hutzel. Uh, very inspiring, thank you for the insights. Uh, Rothley, what percentage of your non nine to five time do you spend on your uh, side hustle? Um, very much varies with other social things that are going on. Uh, and I suppose the difference between prints and consulting is that with consulting there is a client and there is a deadline. So for the <laughs> F1 exhibition, um, yeah, I was just a, a small part of lots of different suppliers working towards that. So I had a bit more flexible and I, I ended up. Um, I love going down to a coffee shop with my laptop and, and spending three or four hours on a weekend uh, doing this kind of stuff. So if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. Um, difficult to give an exact proportion on time spent uh, outside of work, but yeah. If you, if you kind of move from a dropshipping um, prints business to doing more consulting, then obviously that takes up a little bit more time. Um, so that's a balance that you'd, you'd want to try. And, and I suppose when you get into that consulting world, that's the point at which you, you have clients, uh, so that's the point where you start to think, is this something that I do want to make my main mm. hustle? And I've got a portfolio of, of, of work or people that uh, you get to a point where, okay, I can't deliver on all of this because I haven't got the time because of my main job. And maybe that's the, the time that you start questioning, do I want this to be a main hustle? Thank you. Wow. Well, um Thank you for the fantastic presentation. For all the practical advice, I feel like someone should let Prodigy know that they got a half hour long <laughs> promo about how great they were. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up and invite our next speaker to the stage. Thank you again, James.